The Great Commission, the final commandment of Jesus, His last words, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All nations, far and away, and right next door, across the pond, across the street. We have been challenged to spread His good news to every man, woman, and child on this earth. Make you nervous? Just remember, I am with you always, to the very end of the age.
crimson stain he washed it white as snow.
so busy we forget that God has a plan for the world. There's more going on than headlines and status updates. We need to stop and ask ourselves, what is God's plan and what is he wanting us to do? From the beginning of time, God's plan has been the same, to redeem and rescue humanity from sin and destruction and bring the hope of salvation to the nations. Adam was the first to hear the promise of this great hope, and this promise continues throughout scripture. It is through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ Jesus that God fulfilled the promise to redeem and rescue humanity from sin and bring the hope of salvation to the nations. Christ is the hope of the nations and God has called his followers to participate in his plan to bring the name of Jesus to every continent, every region, every person. It is the call that has inspired men and women to become history makers for the glory of God in every generation. It is the call to go. Over 150 years ago, this same call compelled James Hudson Taylor to devote his life to the people of East Asia and to found China Inland Mission. Now known as OMF, this ministry is bringing God's hope to those without hope. But sadly, today in North and Southeast Asia alone, there are more than 2 billion people who have little to no access to the message of hope. 
over two billion people who have not yet heard the name of Jesus Christ. Our call, our challenge, is to participate in God's plan to reach every unreached people group with the hope and life found in Christ, to shine His light in the darkest places in the world. God's heart beats for those who are without hope. His compassion is all-encompassing and ever-reaching. It lives outside the confines of time and place and even history. His love and mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. James Hudson Taylor once said, The Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. God's call to take part in the Great Commission is as relevant and real today as it has been in any time in history. He wants to use each of us, here and now, to use our time, our talents, and passion to follow in the Great Commission. We all have a part to play. Together, we can experience God's heart to redeem and rescue His people. Together, we can bring the hope of Christ Jesus to the billions without hope. Together, we can bring His plan for salvation to the nations. It's so good to be here, and uh, excuse me if I seem a little incognite or my mind's in other places. I just got in from Guatemala. Um, we just got back to Belpre, where our home is when we're stateside, a little bit before midnight. Um, and uh, me and my son Ashton flew out at uh, 2 a.m. yesterday, and so we are fresh off the boat, as they say. Um, but it is, uh, it's wonderful to be here, and we always love coming here and uh, visiting with you all, and doesn't the church look amazing? And, uh, amen, I guess maybe it doesn't look so good, Pastor, you can say, <laughs> that everybody's super tired, and it's like, yeah, I think it looks great, and it's exciting to me uh, when we go to churches, um, and not necessarily speaking of church growth, but people that you can tell have a vision, and they're forward thinking, and they want to reach their community, and I'm I stay fairly well in touch with Pastor, and I know that you all are out in the community making much of Jesus, and uh, it was really awesome to me to walk in, and uh, I watched too much HGTV myself and saw the accent wall, and, you know, I thought, wow, this is pretty exciting. It looks fantastic, Um, but it is awesome to be here. Take your Bibles, if you would, and uh, turn to 1 Peter chapter number 4, 1 Peter chapter number 4. And I'm going to share, and I'm, I, I'm not going to talk a ton about my ministry right now. I'm going to kind of save that for uh, the, the time that we have after lunch to come back in here to the auditorium and just kind of give a brief update uh, on the ministry. Uh, it, it's going well, and uh, it's, it's, it's exploding. It's more than we can handle. Um, it's super exciting time uh, to be a missionary in Guatemala, and uh, we look forward to sharing all that with you. Uh, here just a little bit later on after lunch. First Peter chapter 4, and verse number 10, the Bible says this, As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And verse 11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth that God in all things may be glorified through Christ Jesus, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This morning, I just want to take a few moments, and um, we, uh, um, like Ms. Crystal, we have people that come into the country, and I don't know how many teams that we have personally hosted. I just left one. I have one that's there right now, and I had to leave to be here and um, they're going to leave on Tuesday. But I would say we've probably had about, probably close to a 1,000 people that just in the last calendar year come and visit us and minister with us in Guatemala. And uh, we're, obviously, we're, we would love to have you all too, and I know Ms. Crystal would, so uh, she asked first. So you would go by there and then come down to Guatemala. But we'd love to have you all come. But uh, I get to, a lot of times to, to, to talk to people, and we got downtime. We eat together. We pray together. We cry together. We rejoice together. Um, but I like to spend time focusing on people, the individuals that come down, because to me it's a big deal. It's a lot of work, as you well know, when someone comes. It's a lot of pressure. You want to try to keep them safe. Um, and, and I know Pastor Jonathan knows just because of being in Guatemala, it's a pretty intense place to live in Guatemala City, and there's a lot of variables that could happen. That, uh, you can Google it. I don't want to get into it right now. But um, 
uh, it's, to me, it's a huge deal when somebody comes. And uh, this morning, I just want to take a little bit of time and talk about you this morning. I don't want to talk about me this morning, and I, got, I get to do that all the time, and I'll get to do that here in a little bit. But I want to talk about you guys and all your dirty little secret. No, I don't want to do that. The pastor's told me enough. I don't want to react. No, no, he's never told me a thing. But I want to talk specifically to you this morning. And, and even more specific, I want to talk about the special gift that God has given to each and every person here today. Before we do that, let's pray one more time. Lord, thank you for the day. Lord, I pray that you would just guide my tongue and my thoughts. And um, Lord, I, I, I've tried to come prepared this morning, um, but at the same time, I want to say what you would have me to say. I want you to speak to the hearts of your people, including mine, Lord. Uh, please be with us, Lord. Bless here the next 20 minutes. And we pray. Amen. We get asked all the time, uh, Tess and I do, uh, about missions and about uh, where we live, if, if we're crazy for doing what we do. Um, you know, it's one thing to uproot your family and go live in a foreign country, and it's another thing to uproot it and go live in a third world country like we're right. Then it's another thing to go to a third world country that is highly violent like where we live at, and we have 500 earthquakes a year, and, you know, we have to live behind razor wire and all those things. And people ask all the time of us, I mean, I mean that you're, you're in the middle of extreme poverty. The average salary in the villages where we work is 4 to $5 a day if you have work. And, and why would you do that? And my answer is pretty simple. It's because of this one thing. And Ms. Crystal talked about uh, her answer and why she does what she does. And uh, she loves God, and she feels commanded to do it. And I loved her saying it's reasonable service. I don't hear people say that very often, but I think about missions the exact same way. Uh, it's, it's my reasonable service to God. But why do I do it? Because, and I'm going to give you an answer right now, because what gift that you or I have is not my gift or your own gift. It's not of myself. It is received from Jesus Christ himself for him. We saw in the verse it says this. It says um, uh, that God, in verse number 11, that God and all things may be glorified. He has given us this, not just this calling, but this specific gift to do what we do. This thing called international missions. And this morning, he's given you that exact same thing. And, 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 and I think you understand this, but I, I want to reiterate this thought again and ingrain it more in your mind. Uh, I think about it all the time. There's some super talented people in this world, whether it's sports, music, acting, whatever the case may be. I oftentimes think, A, is this person a Christian? Um, sometimes it's pretty easy to tell depending on what you see. Um, but number two, uh, if they're not a Christian, God gave them these certain abilities for a certain reason for him. I created in him his, because the Bible teaches us that his will is for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the, save, the, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And they've been given that for a reason, but they're using it for something else. They're using it for self-gain. They're using it because of their own dreams and trying to just follow their own path in life. But I want you to understand that uh, we are given this gift, and this life is not our own, and you, specifically this morning, you are special to Him. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says this, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if you did receive it, why do you glory if thou hadst not received it? It's something that was given to, it wasn't, uh, and, and I'm going to try to get a little bit deeper about specific gifts here in a moment, but it wasn't something that you've done. Yeah, you can kind of hone skills, and uh, for one thing, Miss uh, um, Crystal was talking about growing tomatoes. You know, I can't, I can't grow nose hair, praise the Lord, right? I mean, I don't have, there's certain things you can work on, and you can try to develop it, but God has given you special gifts. He has given it to you for something this morning. Then it stand, if it stands then to reason, you're gifted for a reason and whatever it is. I'll say that again. It stands in to reason that you're gifted for a reason. Everybody here 
as gifted for a reason. You say, you don't understand, I can't do this. No, no, no. I want to explain to you this morning, everybody here is gifted for a reason. Everybody is. 1 Corinthians 4.10 also says, We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. They, they were willing to just be thrown out there, put themselves out, and, and bear their soul in front of men and suffer persecution, and they did not care. They took the gift that was given to them, and they were doing something that God called them to do with it. And I just want your mind to go to that place today. What God has for you and your gift, and are you using it? Do you even recognize that I think we so often look at, at when we see, when we think about gifts, we think about talents and abilities that you'll see maybe up on a stage like this. And it is, it could, it's not that. Yeah, those are gifts and those are talents, but they go so much deeper. And I'll tell you here in a minute, there's gifts that I don't have that I wish I had, that it's nothing that you necessarily see in a public setting, but I wish that I had it. This, this then begs the question, why aren't more people laying it on the line for Jesus Christ today. Why haven't we, as a church, become fools, as the apostle said? What causes us to neglect our special gift that God's given us? What is it today? And I believe that um, us as human beings, being sinful in nature, that we're selfish, and we have our own dreams and our own desires. And, and I think the majority of the time, things like that, is what makes people neglect the gift that Jesus Christ himself has given unto them. But I also believe this, and, and this is what I really want to speak to for the next few moments, is fear, fear of what he has us to do. We don't do it because we've got some type of fear about what he wants, or we're not going to be able to perform the task or do the thing that he has called us to do. I, I really believe that they're, they've got this fear. They say, I, I don't have any talent. I can't do this or that. The last time I tried, brother so-and-so said this, sister so-and-so said this, or it didn't just come out just right. I don't want you to quit that manner of thinking, of worrying. The Bible teaches us we shouldn't compare ourselves among ourselves. And we always do. I do it. I'm a missionary. I, I, I was sitting here watching Miss Crystal, and I was thinking, oh, wow, this is neat, this is neat. Oh, maybe I should do this. And I, I found myself in my mind comparing myself with her while she was giving her presentation. Not in a bad way, but I was just like thinking about what she does and this and that. And I'm like, why, why do we even, we shouldn't. It's a big battle, right? We all battle that. Don't do that. Our text in First Peter 4 says, let him do it. It says, do it as of the ability which God giveth. It doesn't say, let him try it. It doesn't say, let him think about it. And this is a pet peeve of mine, especially when it comes to like picking up trash at the church. It doesn't say, let him pray about it, right? Hey, we could use someone to help straighten up chairs. Well, let me pray about it, Pastor. No, it doesn't say any of those things. It says, let him do it. Do it. And I want to encourage you today to do it. Whatever it is that God's put in your life, He wants it to be made manifest for His glory, but you've got to do it. You can't think about it anymore. It's, it seems like yesterday, but it's already been five and a half years ago that my dad passed away when I was in Mexico at the time, and we were finishing up the church plant in Mexico before Guatemala. And something in me changed. And my dad was only 55 years old when he passed away. And the thing that changed within me was life knowing that life is but a vapor. It appears for a moment, the Bible says, and then it's gone forever. And so many of us are sitting here thinking about it. Maybe we're praying about it. I want you to know that you are special, and you have a certain set of gifts and abilities, even if you can't see it, and I liken it unto this. How everybody probably knows, right, that scientists say no two snowflakes are alike, Right? And if you put them underneath a microscope, they're all unique and are different. And you're the same way. You say, well, I'm just an average Joe. I'm just a common person. No, you're not. You're special. And you're perfect. And God knows. I mean, he, he can look in his microscope, and he knows exactly what you look like and what you're laid out to do. Your spiritual DNA is unique. You say, yeah, I'm just this, man, there's a thousand people. No, there's not. 
There's one you created for a specific purpose. Ephesians 2.10, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We are God's masterpiece. Think about that for a second. You are God, depending on what version you're reading, we are His masterpiece this morning. The Creator of the universe who hung the stars and the moon, we are His ma- He made us. What's a masterpiece? A masterpiece is made or it's produced the quality imparted to a thing and the process of making it. God has created you. His masterpiece. You're special. Not like, yeah, he's special. No, you're special. And he's got something exciting for you. He's got something that only you can fulfill. And I tell people this all the time. You know, we're in missions and, and you guys feel the need, and rightly so, to fulfill the Great Commission. You're not all called. That's not your spiritual DNA to be where I'm at or where Ms. Crystal is located at. But you guys send us, but at the same time, I think about my, I have a responsibility for Peyton City, just like you guys feel you have a responsibility to reach the world. I have the same responsibility here. So again, it stands to reason you all are sitting here. You all live in this area, this town, or St. Mary's, wherever it may be, for a specific reason. Your DNA is unique. Something he planned from the family. This, 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 this God of the universe who created this perfect masterpiece, did it from the foundations of the world. Think about that for a moment. So your DNA is unique. Not only is your DNA unique, your spiritual time is unique. We know the Bible works for such a time as this. And I alluded to the passing of my father uh, a few moments ago. Time is important. And people say, slow down, and, and I try, <laughs> and my wife knows how I think. I mean, I'm, I was on my way here this morning, and she's like, is there a reason you're driving 40 miles an hour? You know, I had like this big old hunting truck, you know, right up on my rear end and coming down past St. Mary's, and I said, no, I was just daydreaming. You know, I was thinking about things that I need to do, and I was thinking about the ministry, and, you know, I just got here, and I woke up this morning, and now here I am all of a sudden in a church in the United States. And, but time is important. The Bible says this, we know this in Jeremiah 1, 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. He has known you from the beginning, since the very beginning. We know life is short, and your work is not only yours, but it was gifted. And as, as being a created masterpiece, it was imparted to you from God. And He put it in you, whatever it is that He has you to do, and the abilities that you have. But He has it for you for today. Today, He needs you. This world needs us. I think you all would agree with me. And we're able to watch a little bit of CNN or Fox or whatever. And it's super discouraging to be outside the United States. I can't imagine what it's like to be in the United States and watch it. It's, I think it's different because we're removed and we're a little bit further back. Uh, and, and I don't know if Chris, it feels the same to you. It just You see it differently. when you, they, they say, hey, we need to step back from the situation, right? And we're going to evaluate the church as pastor. I'm sure he does that. He, he's got to kind of remove himself and, and look at it as a whole. And when you see it, you realize from that perspective, man alive, this country needs you now more than ever as a believer in Jesus Christ. They need that unique gift and that unique ability that's been imparted upon you because you're designed for it. Like that perfect, unique snowflake I talked about. You are designed for this time. And there's stuff, and there's things, and there's people that only you can do. And if you don't do it, it's never going to get done. You're This side of heaven, you're not even going to know it. Think about how many chances, and Miss Crystal was very convicting. She was talking about all the opportunities, and she uses them to be able to, to share the gospel with people. Think about all the opportunities. And God has prepared you. He's got your, your, your I'm struggling, um, Bob, and, and, and you don't understand. I got this. And listen, my family, my wife would say amen if she was a shouter, but my personal family, I'm not talking about her family now. I'm talking about my mother-in-law enough, um, but 
my family, we put the fun and dysfunctional, if you would actually know my family and where I come from. It doesn't matter where you're at. And, and, and I, I come from a family, I love my family, but we're totally dysfunctional. But it, God knew it from the foundations of the world. He knew Bob was going to be here, and he gave me exactly what I needed to deal with all those things. Yes, to help me, but for him and for his glory and for his kingdom. And you are where you're at right now. Now, yes, I'm, I'm not talking about sin and we're in a spot because of bad decisions. I'm talking about in general, in life, the way you are, the way you talk. You may be quiet. You may think, raise your hand if you could get up here and raise your hand if you think it would be difficult for you to get up here and stand up here and do what I'm doing right now. Raise your hand. Okay. Now, I noticed Mr. Wayne didn't pass. <laughs> Hello. Okay, good example, right? For me, I don't know why, my mom talks a little bit, but nobody in my family, I, I can go up and I can, if I was in front of 10,000 people, I feel the same as if I'm in front, I don't know why. Why well, I, I know why, but it's God's just, and it's not any more special than somebody that is super faithful setting up the room back there for dinner today. It's, it's zero. Where we work at, we're in the middle of a difficult area. And they're always super thankful. Whether And you know, Pastor, by when you build those houses down there. And uh, I often wonder, because I pass a lot. I'm in different areas now. And I'm like, I wonder if Pastor Jonathan was here. You know, I'll see him there. And um, they're very thankful. And I always tell them, I am not any better than you. As a wise missionary, Chuck Marshall, some of you may have heard the name or know him, once said, we're all made out of the same cookie dough. I'm no better than anybody else because I can get up here. I can't play the guitar. I wish I could play the guitar. I wish I could sing like my girls could sing. I wish I could dribble the basketball like my son can dribble the basketball or cook like my wife. This is just what God has for me. It's my time. It's your time. And I want you to know this, and we're getting ready to close. It's all good. I like that term. It's all good. Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. That doesn't mean, folks, that life situations are always easy. I think, because we try, sometimes we, we, we are prone to pull things out of context in the Bible, uh, especially preachers or teachers, sometimes we want to like make it fit what we want to say. But when I read it, it, I never really thought about it this way before, but I'm looking at it in this context as a scriptural, a scriptural affirmation or confirmation that if we walk in Him... Doing so confidently, not in your abilities, but what he imparted unto you is that masterpiece, his special masterpiece, then it's all good. It's all good. I'm not saying, oh, it's all good, let's be lazy. No, no, no. I mean, it's all good. Whatever he has you doing, wherever he has you at, whether it may seem big to you, whether it may seem small to you, it's good and it's perfect. And it's what he, and again, I'm not going down the road of y'all disobeying the voice of God. I'm talking about, you know, this is where God wants you, and you feel like, I, I, I can't do this, I can't do that. No, it's good. It's good, and it's perfect, and it's right. Grasp that today. It says in 828, know that all things work together for good. All things. Do not neglect the gift. Ephesians 2.10 says we are created in Christ Jesus to good works. It doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter what anybody says about you. What anybody thinks about you. You're special and you're priceless in the eyes of God. Far above the most prized item in any museum this world has ever seen. And I want to close with this. I got these two papers. And uh, um, boys, I want you for a second to um, get off Facebook. No. <laughs> Uh, I'm just kidding. Hopefully they weren't. I guess I'm going to find out later. Uh, I, I, I want to show you something. I want you to look at these two different pieces of paper. I want you to go around as many as you guys have and just pass them out to the people. And this is for yours to keep. All right? These are colored pictures from kids that we work with in our feeding centers and Bible centers uh, strung across the inner city in three different villages in Guatemala. Right? I picked out this one. This is Jessica Amalia. And she, she did a really good job, right? 
She's got her, her, her huipil, which is a colorful fabric, her little traje. And this here is Juan Miguel. And Juan Miguel, you know, he's a little bit more straightforward. It's kind of how guys think, right? It's like purple, brown, throw some red pants in. Half the field is blue. <laughs> this is pretty neat, isn't it? But you know what? When I look at these, when I look at these, I see a masterpiece. Why do I see a masterpiece? Because I believe it's special just like you. Because we look at it, we look at our lives a lot like this, right? We look at this girl here, we're like, man, you know, they got it all put together. And, and sometimes you look at yourself like this, and you're like, I, I feel like this. You know what I mean? It's like half done, and, you know, I forgot to put on boxers this morning when I left the house or whatever. Wait, that, I should wait. I don't know. See, I told you. I'm dysfunctional. I don't know why I went there. But, you know, we look at ourselves. But guess what? These kids did this with reckless abandon. They didn't care what he thought. We work with hundreds, hundreds, enough to where you could bring when you all have sent us school supplies. And we'll, we can, I can have a suitcase full of crayons, and we'll have to rubber band them in packs of three to hopefully get them to each kid. So what did the kids do? They took what was in front of them, or crayons that were in front of them, and they did this. There's a reason I believe the kingdom of heaven is like unto a child. We've got to have that mindset. We don't, don't care what anybody thinks. They take what's given to them, and they do what's in front of them, and they're content with it. They're content with it. These are yours to keep, by the way. And hopefully it's a reminder to you, guess what? You're a masterpiece. Doesn't matter if you look like this. Doesn't matter if you look like this. You're perfect. Take what God has given you and use it. Because it's something that only you can fulfill this side of heaven. We're going to show a brief video. And, you know, I believe the most important thing for us is to take a step and to get out. Is what that verse say? Do it. Not think about it. Do it. Make a choice. Make a choice. I'm going to follow him. Whatever the cost, whatever he wants me to do, whether it's a McDonald's or a mission field, and I'm going to do it. And we trust this brief video is encouragement to you. There's a true story of a small village in India. And in this village, there was this family that came to a saving faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. This agitated the village so much and everybody became so upset that an angry mob gathered and shoved them into the public square. The village chief confronted them and he said to the man, if you and your family will not recant your faith, you all will surely die. The man didn't know what to say or what to do. And so the only thing that came to mind for him were the words of a song that he himself had composed when he had first surrendered his life to God. And so he began to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. And with that, horrifically, his children were killed. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. He was given another chance, this time with his wife's life on the line. And yet he continued to sing, Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, 
After her tragic death, he was given one final opportunity, this time to save himself. And yet he continued to sing. Even though that man and his family died on that day, something remarkable happened. A seed was planted in the heart of that village chief, a seed that began to grow over time, and eventually he called the community together in that very same neighborhood, in that very same square, and he renounced his former faith and declared his allegiance to Jesus Christ. And a celebration broke out in that moment, and the gospel began to flourish and to grow in that community, not just in that village, but across the whole region. Because they had seen real faith, and they knew the true character of God because of a family that believed and sacrificed, even under the penalty of death. No turn.